All right, great. All right, well, thanks everyone for um, coming to our first session today, um, 2022. Uh, so on behalf of the Society of Petroleum Engineers of Trinidad and Tobago and the board, I would like to welcome you all to today's session. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Susan Jemmert and I'm the Gaia Liaison for SBETT. And today's format is extremely relaxed. So we don't have a formal presentation. And so in that regard, we'll be having a chat, myself and Raquel. Uh, so I encourage you to kind of type, you know, your questions in the chat box. Also do feel free to raise your hands, your virtual hands, uh, if you have a question. And it's okay, you can, you know, turn on your, turn on your camera and feel free to speak. Uh, so today let's turn our focus to our guest. So today I have the pleasure of introducing Raquel Moses. She's the newest UN Global Ambassador in the race to net zero. She is incredibly sought after as a critical advisor as her success in the public and private sectors has allowed her to drive important advancements on world changing topics that require regional consensus, such as climate change, sustainability and building resilience. Raquel is here today to chat with us a bit more about climate change and climate financing. So Raquel, welcome. Nice to have thank you. Thank you so again. much. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, well, let's start first. So explain a bit about you know, your organization, who you are, and even your role as a UN Global Ambassador. Sure. So. Um, as you know, my name is Raquel Moses. So the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator was formed after the 2017 hurricane season when Hurricanes Maria and Irma just decimated parts of the Caribbean. Dominica lost the equivalent of 226% of GDP. And there was a, a lot of damage in Puerto Rico and as well as other islands. And so um, the prime ministers of Grenada, Dominica and St. Lucia got together and contacted Richard Branson and said, listen, something needs to be done. Because what's happening now is that we are remaining sitting ducks. We are constantly going through this cycle of rebuilding and then being destroyed and rebuilding again. And we, we, we don't seem to be making any progress. And so there are a couple of things that they thought needed to happen. First, they thought that the Caribbean needed to be created as the world's first climate smart zone. So that means modernizing infrastructure, putting in protections in place, um, doing whatever we needed to do to be protected against the worst of climate change. But it also meant that we would be on the forefront of implementing new solutions. So while we're not very large carbon emitters, and that is, of course, outside of, of Trinidad and, and Guyana, for example, as a region, um, we are we can create new solutions and new technologies can then export to the rest of the world and use, including within the region, and use those exports, use that technology, use that intellectual property, use that new way of doing things as an opportunity to build our economic resilience. Because part of what happens is, and, and the wealthiest of countries can't sustain the damage that we incur and then have to rebuild from. But there are a number of other things that, um, if our economies were stronger and then there was less damage, that that would close the gap in terms of what we have to do each time we're damaged. And so we are hoping that by implementing loss and damage and those kinds of things, we have the opportunity to put pressure on both sides. So they decided that we would create the world's first climate smart zone and I'll get back to loss and damage when we talk about my role as an ambassador. But um, that we would create this world's first climate smart zone, we would create jobs in the sector, we would pursue as much renewable energy as possible, we would pursue conservation and, and keeping the region safe. So that's, that's why the accelerator was, was created. And then in 2018, at the end of 2018, we were launched and we started our incubation process and then we were incorporated in 2020 and have been developing projects from the inception and, and I'll talk you through what some of those projects look like and so we were formed and then um, my role as a global ambassador 
representing the Caribbean and I'm the only representative from a small island developing state. So by virtue of my appointment, I also represent other small island developing states. And it is to, yes, raise awareness for the impact of climate change, but also to help give us a voice on an international stage. So I was fortunate enough to attend and speak at COP because we need to address issues like loss and damage, issues like climate finance, issues like um, the, the solutions that, so, so we get, let me just take a step back. Um, when we talk about things like climate finance, which is a lot of what this talk is about, we think about um, the, the 100 million per year pledge, for example, and what that means. But what the nuance in that is that 100 million, uh, 100 billion, sorry, pledge isn't all, isn't all grant money. It's a, it's a mix of grants and loans and, you know, in some instances, equity funding and, and other types of funding that becomes available. But the challenge is that there is very little accountability as to, okay, well, I've made this pledge. How do I ensure that we close the gap on that pledge? Well, um, when we see the availability of funding for the region, there's a lot of funding available and there's a lot of need for funding, but there's a fundamental mismatch in terms of the kind of funding that's available and the kind of funding that we need. We need mostly, not entirely, but mostly grant funding because so many of our projects don't create a cash flow. So it's very difficult then to then service a loan if let's say you're replanting mangroves and you're not, you're not using the mangroves that you've planted to generate carbon credits that you then sell on a market. And even that process is incredibly lengthy. So it's important that we, we, we address that mismatch in the funds. But my role as an ambassador is to raise awareness, is to um, form relationships, is to help to get that funding to the region, but also in things like race to zero and race to resilience, is to help companies in the Caribbean to make those kinds of commitments so that as intended, the region is leading from a position of power and leading from a position of not showing up to the, an international audience and saying, listen, these are things that we need, which is entirely true. There are a multitude of things that we need, but showing up to an international audience saying, these are the ways in which we are demonstrating our leadership on this issue. And we need for the developed nations to at least do their part because we have the least fiscal space in order to make the changes. And we didn't benefit from the economic um, revolution, the industrial revolution that got us into this position. So we certainly should not bear the full brunt of the cost of making this transition. But we are hopeful that through our projects, and I'll talk you through the kinds of projects that we're seeing, through our projects that we have the ability to attract funding, and also to demonstrate leadership on a global stage as to what the Caribbean is doing, the kinds of things that we have enabled already, and the, the level of innovation that we are willing to undertake in aid of our own survival. And by doing that, implore, sometimes um, encourage, coerce, cajole, whatever it requires, to get the powers that be to do those things with us so that we are all in this race together, right? So some of the projects that we're seeing at the Accelerator, we have sort of four main bodies of work. The first one is the creation of a climate smart map. And that is mapping where we are today against where we intend to get to. Because it's always easy to say, okay, well, we want to be the world's first climate smart zone. But what does that mean in practical terms? What does that mean that at the end of this process, what will we see? Where do we tick the boxes? So the first body of work is to create that climate smart zone and to understand for each country, what are the things that they are going to need to put in place to help protect them, but also to demonstrate leadership and to, for example, the second pillar is 90% renewable energy for all. And in pursuing that 90% renewable energy, that also creates economic resilience because they're not paying as much. 
you know, to import fossil fuels that then helps to degrade our environment. And I understand that you're petroleum engineers, but I, I mean, I don't think you're you're in a in the dark as to the situation. And for example, if if all all oil and gas exploration stopped today, and if all um, use of of oil and gas stopped today, the world would not be okay. I mean, we need for this to continue. A lot of the things and the solutions that we need to 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 have in place require traditional energy, the energy that you are, are working towards. However, what we need desperately is a transition plan. None of us want to be the blockbuster. Um, we all want to be the Netflix. You want to be able to understand, to see what's happening, and then to determine, okay, given we are and the impact on the environment, how can we together create a path to a brighter and more resilient future. And on top of that, what we know is that trillions of dollars will need to be spent on this transition. And there will be opportunities for all. What we'd like to see are opportunities for the region, but there will be opportunities for all. And the quicker that we lead the transition journey, the better off we will be. So we can either sort of continue to look backwards or to look forwards and, and realize that there are so many opportunities that lie ahead in this transition. And one of the unique opportunities that the region has is we can demonstrate transition at scale because our countries are very small. So for example, Barbados that is looking at decarbonizing their transportation sector by 2030, that is a case study waiting to happen. And so we have, impact investors and donors who want to help them do that transition because it's something that everyone will need to figure out. So that's the sort of thing that we do. So 90% renewable energy for all is saying that, listen, at a minimum, the region can financially benefit and endure going 90% renewable energy. Right now as a region, we're at about 17%. And, and that is with standouts like Costa Rica who are already at 100%. But we also have, you know, most of the OECS are, are geothermal countries. And so they are currently uh, around the 1% mark, but they have the ability to go from zero to 100, which would be great because then there are all kinds of things and possibilities that that will unlock not just for them, but for all of us. So one of the things that we're pursuing is 90% renewable energy for all. And I'll, I'll tell you one of the exciting projects in that is a solar assembly facility located in Trinidad and Tobago. We have just uh, gotten an investor on board. And so we are in the process of getting all of the T's crossed and the I's dotted so that we're able to get this factory up and running. And that will provide jobs but it will also build our capacity in renewables so that we understand how to um, work with renewables, build solutions on top of renewables, and we can use our single market for the export, but we can also export to North and South America as a part of this program to build our own economic resilience. So that's, that's an example of a project we would have in 90% renewable energy. We also have a project that's called, a, a, a pillar that's called 30 by 30, which is protect 30% of our land and 30% of our ocean by 2030. And that's a global program that many countries are a part of. And we're trying to get as many Caribbean countries as possible as a part of that effort. What we see with 30 by 30 is that there is no, there is no lack of, of So there, um, you got Adrian just they're at a hundred percent or close to a hundred percent. I think they are essentially at a hundred percent. They can run for three hundred days on renewable energy. So they are. I think there are gaps that can be closed, but they are considered from a. There are seven countries that are considered a hundred percent, and Costa Rica is among those. Um, I think that there are still some things that they need to do with battery storage to be completely um, fossil fuel free, but they are essentially at 100%. So um, what we're seeing at, uh, at 30 by 30 is um, protect 30% of the land and ocean by 2030. And that gives nature a chance to regenerate. And that is what 
um, most of the scientists believe is required for um, required for for nature to regenerate itself. But when we talk to countries across the region, there is no lack of effort or lack of willingness to pursue 30 by 30. No one's saying, oh no, I have no desire to protect 30% of my land and 30% of my ocean by 2030. Instead, they're saying, okay, how will I pay for it? Because you don't just say, set it and forget it, 30% is protected and you wave a magic wand and it happens. You actually have to hire people for the conservation. You have to, you have to put in monitoring systems. You have to measure, you have to understand what's going on. And so we're seeing a lot of excitement around um, satellite imagery, for example, um, that, that is tracking you know, protected areas and, and complementing the work that's taking place on the ground. The most exciting project that we have in 30 by 30, which also complements access to funding for uh, climate, climate finance funding, for example, is the intrinsic value instrument. And that is where we put a value, we, we value the ecosystem services that nature is providing. So when you have a forest, for example, that forest is productive. It is a home for animals. It is providing biological services that allows, you know, carbon sequestration. It allows all sorts of things to happen. It allow it provides inputs to our food chain, and all of those things have value. So when you when you mow down a forest, it isn't just that oh well this was this land was unproductive and it's now productive. You have destroyed um, services that nature was providing as a part of a you know whether it's, it's biodiversity and everything else that happens. So using different kinds of mechanisms, they are valuing the ecosystem services that nature is providing and using that value to create an, an instrument that is then floated on the New York Stock Exchange. And that instrument has value to, similar to, and I, I use this example a lot, which may not be the best example, but similar to a non-fungible token or an NFT, it is something where somebody says this has value to me so for, so um and can be resold so as we get closer and closer to 2030 governments will be interested pension funds will be interested other kinds of entities will be interested in the protection of nature and they can rather than sort of seeking out a project or a series of projects they can then invest in these ecosystem services through this instrument that's floated on the stock exchange. And we're looking at each, what will be called a natural asset company, then um, being valued up to the likes of 200 million and generating funding that can be used for conservation. We're also seeing things like um, debt for nature swaps. So Costa, uh, Belize just closed on the largest debt for nature swap or blue bond, actually um, blue bond that has ever been, been done. The one before that was in the Seychelles and it was just a couple million. And what they're doing is they had an enormous amount of debt and governments forgave that debt in exchange for them using the money to conserve and restore nature. And so those are the kinds of things that we're seeing and that provided them with $365 million worth of space that they can then use for conservation. So those are the kinds of, now we are looking at potentially creating one in the Eastern Caribbean and it will be the first multi-country um, blue bond. But we think that after the Seychelles example and after the uh, Belize example, we have the ability to create um, this kind of, of asset that can then provide funding for conservation and for restoration. And then the last of our four pillars, so the first one was the climate smart map, the second one was 90% renewable energy, the third one was 30 by 30. The last one is 1.5% green jobs. And in that one, um, what we want is, yes, we can put all of these things in place, but unless we are creating a sustainable future with money available for funding the transition and creating a green-based economy, we are just sort of putting a stopgap and, and making incremental 
progress versus looking at how do we transition our economies? You know, so it's the difference between buying solutions from others or creating new capacity and solutions within the country that we can then not only export, but have a more resilient economy basing it on, on green solutions. So one of the projects that we have in, in, this, in this area is a climate smart agriculture project that's quickly spreading to other islands, uh, starting in Jamaica. And we are using entrepreneurship to create these indoor farms that then private sector conglomerate will buy all of the produce that is using these climate smart methodologies to grow these fruits and vegetables. And so it's creating a new way of generating food security that then also supports entrepreneurship and targets in a city or, or at risk use. So it's, it's solving a number of different problems at the same time. We need more food security. We need to, to substitute for imports. We need to create new methods of farming given the what's already taking place. And so all of these things together, um, you know, one such program to help us in that transition is the Climate Smart Agriculture Project. So I know that was a really long answer to one question. Well, we have and one I, question. We had one question come in, right? Uh, how soon is the solar manufacturing plant expected to be up and running? And also as a follow on to that, what sort of capacity, uh, number of jobs you would expect that to provide, if you could divulge that information? Yeah, so, I, well, the timeline that we're looking at could be fairly soon. We could potentially have that factory up by the end of this year. However, my best guess is that it will be in 2023. Right? I mean, we know how complicated things can be, but the factory itself will not take long to establish. Um, the, the number of jobs is not going to be in a, a tremendous um, job additive. It's not going to be tremendously job additive, but it is going to, um, I would say, under 100 jobs for sure. But, but um, the specific numbers, when we start sizing the kinds of panels, you know, how long we're gonna run the, the assembly line and all of those things, we'll have a better idea. I know Carla, there's another question, like if it, is it that, is your question a follow on question to the, to the solar manufacturing question or um, Adrian had another question? Yeah, it was. I, oh. um, I read in the papers that Marvin Gonzalez was talking about legislation being approved, especially after the power outage we had last week. And so I'm thinking if that happens for the approval for people to have solar in their homes, it's good timing. So I was just wondering what, you know, what kind of timelines we're looking at. Yeah, so we're definitely looking at uh, having things up and running, hopefully by next year. The challenge is it's it's a two-prong approach, huh? because we can we can have solar in we can approve legislation to have so independent solar in homes, but until we address the issue of the um, subsidization of the energy that we receive, solar isn't necessarily very competitive in Trinidad and Tobago. And so I think it has to be a two-pronged approach. When we look at the subsidies, I, it's easy for me to say, oh, well, all subsidies should be removed, but it's similar to the conversation about, um, can we stop all oil and gas? There's a reason for the subsidies. However, there needs to be a phasing out of the subsidies because you are disadvantage, you're creating a disadvantage for renewables by subsidizing fossil fuels. And you can't continue to do that if you expect the transition to take place. So like with all things, it's, it's, it's nuanced, it's complicated, but it's solvable, right? And I saw that, um, Adrian, Adrian and it's Raquel, not Rachel, but thank you. I have a bit of difficulty with the intrinsic value as you stated it. Isn't existing forests already banked in the existing carbon cycle so that, so that shouldn't new or incremental forests be taken for a net carbon removal credit? So it's not a carbon credit. That's not what I'm saying at all. So it is, for example, let's say I have no yard, 
let me, let me give you a, a crude example. And I've never used this example. So if it goes very wrong, Adrian, you have to forgive me, right? But I, let's say, for example, I'm sitting in my house and I have no yard and I have no greenery to look at. And you have a plot of grass and I'm like, boy, that's pretty. And I get up in the morning and I go out on my patio and I drink my coffee looking into your green grass because I don't have it. And then I see one day you come with a truck with some cement bricks. Like you're going to build over that one patch of green that we are both looking at. And I say to you, hear what? Why are you, buying, why are you building this, this structure on the grass? And you say, well, I'm going to build this structure because I need storage. And I said, hear what? I will pay for you to store your stuff in, in Karani, but please just keep the grass because I enjoy looking at the grass and the grass is useful. So it's not a carbon credit. It's not like that's already that I agree with you that carbon is already banned. But what it is is a preservation where somebody is saying, I am interested in this preservation continuing to be preserved at the expense of your not using it for building a hotel or creating something else. These ecosystem services are important enough to me that they need to be preserved. And so I will pay you to keep them just as they are. And over time, that instrument will increase in value as we get closer to, the, to 2030, where we need to see things maintained. Because remember, on one side, we need to cut emissions, but on the other side, we certainly don't need to be creating anymore. So this is on the side of let's not create anymore. Let's not remove any carbon sinks that we have. And I will pay you to keep that just as it is because that in and of itself has value. Is that okay? okay. Adrian? Okay, well, I hope so. Thank you, and I, I, I give a kind of counter note. So it's the negative or preventing the negative outcome of removing forests or things like that, which is a and therefore that there's a big, yeah, and therefore there's a piece around illegal log, logging in the Amazon and places that will need to be somehow addressed. Thank you. Yes, yes. So so hopefully it can prevent things like that if we were to get people to say, okay, this preservation is important. Um, how do we get money attributed to one, not making the land produce anything other than what it's already producing, and two, money that can help to protect and to observe and make sure that those things aren't going on. So, and we're seeing a lot of interaction between like satellite imagery and blockchain, and it's very, very exciting. It's an incredibly exciting space. All right, so we have another question. Um, is there any opportunity to fund climate resilient technologies in the carbon capture space or cleaner fuels like biofuels? Absolutely, absolutely. Every day we get um, investors who are interested in uh, either looking at, I'd say the, the thing that we get interested in most is blue economy. However, definitely carbon capture. And we want to get carbon capture solutions from the region going out to the globe. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One, yes, to build our economic resilience. But two, just out of plain fairness, which I know um, might seem a bit, a bit puerile, but how are we going to allow the countries that did this to be the sole benefactors of the solutions to solve the problem that they created? That can't be, right? You know, so we have to have some of the solutions. We have to benefit from some of the solutions because we are the brunt of what needs to be spent to protect ourselves. We are spending and we absolutely need to share in some of the windfall from the transition globally without question, right? And then let's see, with regard to climate smart agriculture, will there be any training available for farmers interested in changing things? Absolutely, um, but I think it's it's uh, it's more than it's more than training. But training is certainly something that we're looking at. And one of the things that we require of any of the suppliers that we work with is that there is some element of philanthropy work that they do. So if they're coming in to sell us a new method of farming, then they can provide some free training alongside that new method of farming. So that again, we have the opportunity to get people to build 
um, build capacity within the region and learn new things and build upon the new things that we learn so that we are not just saying, okay, we've, we've received this new capacity, but we're saying we take your new capacity and we add on to that. And that is creating a, a, a bigger and better, we're increasing the size of the pie available for the region. Carla, you had another question? Yes, yes. Um, as an add-on, I know you mentioned Jamaica. So is it that you all are starting off with a, a climate smart farm in Jamaica and then you kind of jump off from there? Yes, yeah, so at the moment, so it, it was meant to be that we would have the farm up and running in Jamaica and then start looking at the pilot has been successful. We've produced um, X number of, of crop cycles. We now move to other regions. But because the need for food security is so extreme, we are seeing projects in Trinidad, in Bermuda, in Anguilla, already starting to look at the model that we're using in Jamaica. And they are just a few steps behind. So, and, and we're like, listen, we're gonna just do it all together. I don't, not a problem. Yeah, just, just one more question. So I, I know someone personally that just got some land interested in farming. So if they were interested, how do they get information? Should they reach out to you? I mean, your company? Yeah, I would say reach out to hello at uh, caribbeanaccelerator.org. And that would be a great way to engage and to find out, okay, um, how much land is it? Because it's mostly, mostly we're looking at indoor farming because of what we're seeing happening and because of the ability to like control pesticide use and all of the things that are not uh, deleterious to the environment. So what we hope is that um, that we're doing a lot of indoor farming. Again, the soil is already so incredibly damaged, but depending on what they have available and what methods are available, we can certainly, one, a primary function of our work is matchmaking. So we can match make an available um, farmer with an investor who has a solution and is willing to partner towards um, import substitution as an example. I see we have some more, another question. Um, considering biofuels and private companies' economic interests, we need to ensure that the, that neither agricultural land nor forest is cleared to save plant sugar cane to produce bioethanol. Oh, so that's a comment. Yeah. And Agreed. Then... And we have so much, we're seeing so much innovation. So for example, we're seeing sargassum transformation in, in creating biofuels. We're also seeing um, using farm, farm waste to produce bioplastics. So we're seeing a lot of in innovation. Today, I talked to a company that's using plastic waste and converting that into resin that can be used to fortify cement. So you're reducing the, the um, carbon footprint of cement while taking care of plastic waste. And so those are the kinds of solutions that we're seeing and promoting and, and trying to help bring to bear in the region. Um, yes, I'll put the email in the, in the chat. It's hello at Caribbean Accelerator.org. There you go. So Rebecca, yeah. I have two questions. So the first, sure. I think you touched on it, but I don't know if you could provide some further details. Where does the financing come from? And uh, you did speak about matching investors to um, the projects. So basically, just as a follow on here from Jason's um, question about the email. So anyone can ask for funding. So, and then if we do, like, how do we come and make that proposal? What is needed? It's a business case, I suppose, or like any. Yeah, so I don't want to say anyone because we're a very small team and we're already inundated. But right. there are a couple of things that we do. So, and a couple of sort of places where the financing comes from. One, uh, we have uh, there's there's just philanthropic funding that comes in, right? And there's philanthropic funding that comes in, and that is grant money. And we match make projects that we think have great value with sources of philanthropic. Funding. We are also building out a matchmaking platform on our website to be able to help um, people who are doing the work to connect with sources of funding. So providing 
information about where the funding is and, and where you can access it. Um, the, the other source of funding is you have impact investment where they're looking for a return, but likely they're looking for a modest return and then they will reinvest those returns into another project. So what they want to make sure is that their capital continues to generate um, use. And um, you see that kind of, of uh, impact investment happening from across the globe. We also have the Financial Advisory Committee. And the Financial Advisory Committee is a group of CEOs of regional financial institutions that are interested in funding or um, investing in, whether it's equity or loan or venture debt or any other kind of, of, um, of, of funding mechanism in projects within the region. And so we work with, we send projects to the Financial Advisory Committee on a monthly basis so that they can evaluate the projects, determine what else the projects might need, and then send those on. We are currently what's called a nominator for Earthshot, and Earthshot is a one million pound prize from um, Sir William, uh, Prince William's charity. And that is to fund climate smart solutions across the globe. So whether it is protecting the air or protecting the ocean or um, building capacity on land. So we are an, a nominator for that, for that prize. So money is coming in from a, a variety of sources. We work really closely with the IDB as an example. So the IDB is also a funder of projects across the region. And it is just that matchmaking function. We host investor forums. We, host, uh, we had our last one in December, early December of last year. And we profiled $10.5 billion worth of projects to five impact investors with the ability to invest in those projects. The challenge that we're seeing is that the projects are very small. And because we are a very small team, we have to focus on the projects that have the greatest impact, which typically means that they have a, a large dollar value. So very, very excited around something in the 100 million, 50 million, $30 million range. Less excited about something that's 25,000, 150,000, because the work required is the same amount of work, but it just has far less impact. And so we have to be smart, we have to be uh, strategic. And so we, we need to be able to pursue the projects with the biggest ability to create impact on the ground, impact the most number of people, have the ability to scale across the region and uh, provide a bigger picture win-win-win. Oh, I know we have a couple of questions here, but I just myself asking. So where then do you see the largest number of these projects coming from and uh, which parts of the Caribbean? And then secondly, do you is there much appetite for this in Trinidad and Tobago? Yeah, so I think because I'm here, I'm, I certainly get a lot of um, a lot of um, outreach and a lot of interest here. But I would say where I'm seeing most innovation, St. Lucia. St. Lucia has come up with some incredible stuff. Um, the the biofuels, the sargassum to biofuels, is in St. Lucia. There is a um, handheld desalination plant coming out of St. Lucia. So for a very, very small place, a lot of, of exciting innovations. Um, but yes, Trinidad is, is, is faring well. We need to see more solutions and we certainly need to increase our capacity to review these solutions. So if you go to our website, caribbeanaccelerator.org, there is a place for you to fill out a form and um, send us your solution. So I think that's even better than the, the email because the email is if you have like a question, the form on the website is if you have a solution and then you fill out the form so that we have the details. We are finding a lot of people are submitting solutions to us that don't have a price tag. If you don't know how much your solution will cost to bring to market, then we are, we are not the place for you necessarily because you need, to, you need to at least get to the point of understanding how much money you need. So we are launching this year a series to help educate people about climate finance, how it works, what kind of money to ask for, um, what kinds of, so, so for example, I'll tell you, we, get, we will get a, a, requ a, a request for, I need $40 million to build a solar plant. Now, 
and I want it to be grant money. Even if I could get grant money for a solar plant, I will almost never ever suggest grant money for a solar plant because a solar plant, and this is, this is not the assembly to sell the panels. This is the um, generation of, of, of energy from solar. But I would almost never recommend a solar plant for, uh, for, for, for a grant because that creates a cash flow. Why would you then request a grant for something that has the ability to service debt? Because ultimately it will make a profit and whoever's getting that profit needs to be willing to service that loan. Now, do you need money to help prove the fee feasibility of that project? That can be grant money, that would make a lot of sense. But certainly you need to look at what is your project's capacity to service a loan and what is your project's capacity to sustain itself over time? The, the projects that, that sort of get the least amount of traction are the projects where it's like, okay, it's something that needs to be done repeatedly, but I want money one off as a grant to do it this one time. But then how will it continue? How will that work continue? How will it continue to be funded? And so it's looking at those kinds of things and saying, okay, um, I need to figure out what is a sustainable model for this solution that I believe has value. Okay, thank you. All right, well, we have two questions. Jason, sure. do you want to unmute and ask a question? That would be great. That would be great if you just, yeah. Hi. Just yeah, not... sure, no problem. I really, really enjoyed the talk so far, Raquel. Thanks for your uh, insights here. So just building on the point, I guess, looking at persons who have a vested interest in supporting, you know, these solutions, and you are a a small, you know, individual person like myself. What if I had a grandmother who gave me a nice and some amount of money, and I wanted to use that to to support some of these projects? How could a uh, individual private citizen um, support these? Is it, is it a um, that we could pool funds together through through your organization? Is that a something that you guys entertain? Yes. So so we're looking to do crowdfunding, crowdsourcing funding for projects, so that you can then say, okay. I pick this project, I want to support this project, I want to support this project as a loan, I want to support this project as a grant. And then we can again help match me projects with potential um, impact, small impact investors, yes, to get them off the ground, because we, we're going to need all of our capacity to reach the goals that we've set without question. And so definitely looking at that, and I love that, that you've made that suggestion, because mostly, I think that might be the first question that I've ever gotten on how can I contribute versus how can I get access to the money great no, thanks very much thanks thanks Jason and Matthew Matt you wanted to ask your question hi good day everyone Matthew you're from hi. Jamaica hi a hey, quick question all right yes. so the, we um we have funders um let's say the philanthropic funders do you have, and I know you touched on it a little, refunding projects, however, non-profit projects. Um, I know when you tend to go to probably a funder for um, a grant for a non-profit, the funder will still want to ask, and they may ask indirectly, how will I benefit? Mm -hmm. How do you, how would you approach such a case for somebody who, has an organization, a well-registered organization, but is mm -hmm. seeking funding to train rural community persons who, and I love how you brought up farming, which is big, who are farmers, and also in the tourism sector. Mm -hmm. um, how do you go about um, confronting a funder in relates to those nonprofit <laughs> entities? So, you know, you have to realize um, foundations um, have needs too. And so when they provide their funding, you know, for us, we make sure that our, we have, we continue to raise funding for projects, but our operational uh, budget is funded by a group of amazing donors that, that have decided to fund us. So I, whenever anything good happens, we make sure we let them know directly first. We um, big them up on social media, we find opportunities to understand what are their objectives and how can we help them achieve their objectives. And their objectives may be they want to find 
more solution providers. Their objectives may be they want more credit for the work that they're doing. Their objective may be they want this problem solved. But I think um, there's a saying that I read in this book recently that I thought was absolutely brilliant. Dig your well before you need the water. And that is understand that in all relationships, both parties have the ability to benefit. And so if you are approaching someone with a need for something, understand what their needs are. And it may not be apparent. You may just want to ask the question. So you may ask the question and say, what do you need? Well, listen, I'm having a, a PR issue. And, and so it would be great if I got some good press for doing X, Y, Z. And it could be any number of things, but make sure that you're always asking the question as to what they need and how together you can find a solution. Because again, if you're a nonprofit and their work is to support your work, then you want to be ahead of the line. Because if they're an impact investor, best believe that they are receiving thousands of proposals for the limited cash that's available. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. And I'll, just not to speak out of time, but I like the fact that you also touched on um, the fact that the funders would want something in return. And one of the things that came to my mind also is even at the end of a program, the participants could then present or pitch innovative ideas to those said funders um, in relates to probably their needs. So those are certain things also. Absolutely brilliant. And something as simple as a video testimonial saying, you know, we got this money and we were able to do all these amazing things with it. Um, so yeah, phenomenal. And the people that you're engaging with, they are um, likely working at the, at the foundation, but they're also trustees of the foundation. They are donors to the foundation. So, so they're all sorts of people who would have some semblance of need in this process. So it is to just figure out what those needs are and um, ask the question. Even asking the question, sometimes they're like, you know what, I don't need anything, but I love the fact that you care enough to ask me what I need while you're coming to me with your needs. And that, that for us has opened doors. Great, thank you. Yeah. Smart. Uh, Carly, you had your hand raised? Um, I did. I was going to ask, um, and this is, I guess, a couple of questions ago, if it is you just focused on potential grants or if you did loans as well, if it is, you know, someone who's just interested in funding. And if it is you did um, have access to provide loans, does that come through you or you find a way to go through a financial institution and whoever the, um, the funder is, the financier is? Great question, excellent question. So we consider ourselves at the accelerator funder of last resort. So if you are getting funding from us, it is because we think your project is exceptional, but no one else for whatever reason will fund it. Because we, again, we want to make sure that we are match making as much as possible. Because if we deplete our funds, then we don't have the ability to match make. And there are a lot of funds available. We do not do loans as the accelerator, but there are tons of loans available. So we match make for loans. If you are looking for a loan and you have the ability to service it, I'm, I'm fairly confident that, um, you know, traditional requirements like collateral and those sorts of things may not apply if you have a climate solution. So, you know, send it, fill out the form, send us the details, and then we can work to match make your project with a potential um, funder. And it could be, a, we do what's called blended finance, which is a mix of, um, a mix of grant and loan and equity and mezzanine and all sorts of, of, of blending different kinds of funding to cheapen the cost of capital. So that is an opportunity as well, but it wouldn't 99 times out of a hundred, we are matchmaking and not necessarily giving our money directly. Does that answer your question, Carla? Yeah. Well, uh, any other questions in, from the crowd before we move on? Because I should be nearly time to wrap up. So I just have a couple more. Uh, before sure, sure. So I think it did, do you feel that you adequately touched on challenges and opportunities for climate financing within the Caribbean? 
Well, I think that there's a great, you know, so when we look at the, when we look at the um, landscape of the region, there's a great, if, we, if what we want is to promote entrepreneurship, there's a huge need for venture capital. And we don't have a mature venture capital landscape across the region. Uh, Jamaica, I think of, of, of all of the islands that we've talked to, probably has the most mature market and it's not necessarily mature by US standards. So that I think is a huge opportunity. And the challenge is a very traditional view of, of funding projects. And so we're hoping that by working through the financial advisory, we can at least help them to see things differently. Now, when we've talked to them, um, the, the CEOs of these financial institutions across the region, the challenge isn't their viewpoint. It isn't as though they're like, oh no, we're only doing traditional loans and nothing else. Sometimes, the, many times, the challenge is the legislation, um, you know, KYC information, uh, things put on them by the US as an example. And so what we are hoping to do as a, as a solving that challenge is finding creative ways and then saying, okay, if we understand all of the types of funding that, that are required and we understand all of the types of funding that is available and we match make all of the ones that have the ability to be matched. And then we look at what's left on both sides and see if there are creative ways of getting them to connect with each other. Then we will solve as much of the funding gap as can be solved in the current environment. Okay. And, you know, and then finally to wrap up, um, it's not a just, you know, the last question is around, it's not about just coping or just managing, you know, dealing with it as you had touched on, it's a bit about the mitigation, the actual transition, you know, and transformation. Okay. In your opinion, what, what can we do, you know, uh, if you take it to a personal and a community level? And then I think there's also an opportunity to touch on leadership. Sure. Your All work. right. So I'm going to answer the first question. What can we do? But I'm going to answer it in two ways. One that may not, that may be a bit controversial. And then the, the, the second one is, the, so I'm taking question one in two parts. And then the next one is leadership, right? Okay. So the, the question about um, what can we do? There are a number of things that people can do individually. Certainly simple things like, you know, making sure you recycle, um, using as little single use plastics as possible. When I go to the grocery, I take my bags. When I go to the pharmacy, I take a bag. You know, simple, simple things actually add up and make a big difference. Um, eating less meat. You know, making sure that you are that you're aware of conservation, reading and gaining as much information as possible, promoting things on social media as an example that are supporting the objectives that we have. But with all of that said, if everyone on the planet did what we needed to do, it does not absolve the big corporates and the governments from doing what they need to do. And part of this whole push for individual accountability is to mask the fact that the, the huge corporates and the governments are not pulling their weight. And so we also need to advocate and understand that yes, we need to do our bit. Yes, there is something for everybody to do, but the problem is bigger than that. And everyone needs to be accountable, right? And on the issue of leadership, now this is my soapbox of soapboxes. The reason that we are in this situation is a lack of diversity. It is a lack of, of gender diversity. It is a lack of color diversity. It is a lack of, of life experience diversity. We don't get this far down the road with the planet in the state that it's in if we had enough different points of view. And so we absolutely need to ensure that if you are a woman on this call, that you aspire to leadership. And I know that that is asking a lot but, and that it may be difficult, but you are one of the few in that you are technical. And women from, I have a three-year-old, three and a half, nearly four. And I don't look young. I don't look young enough to be having a child that young, but 
that's another story. But when I read her books, her books are all, oh, you'll be a princess and some knight will come save you. And, you know, you know, Goldilocks and the bears or something else like that. It, it, from, from, from women, from we are born, we are given a particular narrative. And unless we restore the balance in terms of leadership, in terms of diversity of leadership, we will solve this problem temporarily and revert to another state of problems. We absolutely need to have more women in leadership and not just at the middle management level, because that's not where the problem is. The, the problem is at the C-suite level. We need more women on boards for, from a governance perspective, and that's how companies perform better. We need more female CEOs, and we need more women at the leadership levels in governments. There is proven data that suggests that when there are more women in a government, the, the country performs better on its climate objectives. And companies perform better financially when you have more women at the leadership level. So above and beyond, and I'm not saying that we don't care about you men, but it is a fact of, of, of it is a fact that we need more women aspiring to leadership to be able to balance the experience that we're having with the planet. And so um, find a way, set your milestones, make yourself accountable for this transition that needs to take place. And part of that transition is this diversity in thought and diversity in life experience to help us to have a brighter future. Wow, thanks Raquel. All right, well, I, that's it from me, you know, from my end. I don't know, do we have any other questions? Leave one thing in the chat box. I created a solution to decarbonize transport using carbon capture targeting passenger cars using a retrofitted biodegradable, biodegradable carbon capture filter and the waste can be used to rehabilitate soil. Yes, Demani, yes, you can apply on the website, but let me tell you, that is something that we need somewhat urgently. Um, send an email to hello and say, Raquel said <laughs> to put me in contact, please. I definitely want to speak to you about that solution. And Carla. Okay, one more question. <laughs> so you mentioned early on about 1.56 green jobs. Is this <laughs> that expected by 2030? Or what timeline are we talking about? I and mean, is that regional? Yes, it's regional. And we're looking at the first thing that we have to do, right? So I, I can't tell you exactly the number of jobs that means yet, because the first thing we want to do is to count how many people are in the green sector, because at the moment we're not capturing that data. But what we, want, what we want is to have a recognized, in the same way that we know how many people are in the services industry, and we know how many people are in the tourism industry, we want to know how many people are in the green industry, and we want to measure that. And we want to grow that sector. So right now it's not registering on the leaderboard, and we want to establish our baseline and then grow it. And yes, by 2030, but, but you know, it's not like, with all of the things that we want to have happen by 2030, it's not like we sit down and we say, okay, by 2030, we'll get it done. No, it is that you start now, what is the milestone for 2023, 24, 25? Because there are going to be things that have to be in place in order for us to get to these milestones. Got it. Wow, well, thanks. Any other questions, guys? So, Adrian, I'd like to privately chat with you about, oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I was not going to say, I'm not seeing these here in the chat box. <laughs> I'm sorry. Right? Okay, yes. And of course, feel free to contact Raquel directly. I don't know, Raquel, is there, uh, you say to use this email? Hello. At no. <laughs> Listen, use hello. Use hello at Caribbean at Gallery. Yeah. And, and not, that I, not that I would mind, but in the same way that I'm saying to all of you to be strategic, we have to be strategic. I receive, like, I would say 100 LinkedIn requests a day. And um, I'm not very active on LinkedIn, I'm far more active on like Twitter and so on. But if in order for me to do what I have to do, I have to be able to think about time as a resource. 
a finite resource, which it is. And, and I say all the time to people that I talk to, the enemy is not climate change. If we had sufficient time, we could address the issue. The enemy is time and the opportunity is time. So how we use our time is going to dictate our success or failure. So if I'm saying, don't email me directly, it's not because I'm mean spirited or I don't like you guys, you guys have been wonderful. And I think you are part of the hope. I've, I've heard some phenomenal solutions, carbon capture and uh, climate smart agriculture and all sorts of solutions. And I think, again, as technical folks, you would be leading the pack in terms of innovation. And that's what we want to see. But we have to be strategic. All right, great. Well, thank you, Raquel. And I say that on behalf of SDTT and everyone here, thanks for spending any time with us. And we really do appreciate it. And we wish you. you all the best. And hopefully you should get some good, um, um, some get good feedback from the group here. I know many want to contact um, Climate Smart. So hopefully something good will come to you. So thank you once again. On the solutions and, and scale them globally so we can, we can ask for the right amount of money and we can pair you with that money to get those solutions scaled globally. Great. All right, and Earth Shop is still open. It closes on uh, next week. Next week, Monday, I believe, the Earth shot our, um, our evaluations for the one million pound prize. So please uh, take a look at Earth shot. It's on our website as well, caribbeanaccelerator.org. And if you have a great solution, you have the ability to, to get some funding, some a massive amount of funding. And that's all grant funding, that one million pounds for your um, solution. So take a look at that as well. Great. Thank you, Raquel. Thank you again, everyone, for attending and hope to see you the next time around when we meet. Enjoy Absolutely. the rest of the evening. Bye. Bye.